As dawn broke, he arose. Jesus was coming for his kingdom. Coming to save man from sin. Coming to crush the hold of death from within. Coming so man could live with him forever. But man's heart did not desire his saving grace. He came humbly on the unbroken foal of a donkey. As he entered the city, the people rejoiced, but Jesus wept. You see, the crowds didn't want forgiveness and mercy. They desired an earthly victory. They followed Jesus for misguided reasons. They followed his works, but denied the freedom in his words. He came for a spiritual kingdom, not of earth, but the kingdom of heaven. And though legions of angels knelt before him, he did not come to wage war on the Romans, but to wage war on religion. That cancerous hypocrisy driven by pride, which concluded that the sinner should be shamed and excluded. But these very sinners were the purpose of his crucifixion. Make no mistake, Jesus did not die a victim. He was instead the willing sacrifice for our sin. We worship Jesus today, not because of what he may do for us, but because of who he is to us. Our King, our Messiah, and our God. Who brought his kingdom through a cross. The heavy cross that pointed to a promise, a revelation, that one day will stand with every nation, tribe, and language. Palm branches lifted high, one voice united in a deafening cry, salvation belongs to our God. Jesus is here. His kingdom is here. Jesus is here. His kingdom is here. We're glad you're with us. Excuse me. We're glad you're with us this morning. I want to invite y'all to stand and let's sing together. God is good all the time. Let's sing. Sing out. God is good all the time. yesterday. She is back at Anson's home in Canyon right now. They're really hoping they can get her to a place to where they can fly her and get her back home to Anchorage to where she can go to her doctor and her VA. So just pray that, that they can at least get this to a place to where she can travel, she and her daughter can travel safely. So continue to pray for, for Tamara, Dean Henthorne's daughter. She lives in Anchorage. 
uh, Alaska. So continue to pray for her and pray for that family as they're, they're all struggling through this. We also want to lift up uh, James Hollywood. Continue to pray for him. Also continue to pray for Nancy as she tries to work out and figure out basically what to do. Yeah. And as the, as the doctors at the hospital figure out, try to figure out what to do with James Hollywood, just continue to keep him in your prayers. We want to continue to pray for Judy Kidwell. Continue to pray for Faye. Miss Faye, Faye is here this morning. Thank the Lord. She's doing a lot better. So we are glad that she is here. Miss Faye Flowers. So, but continue to pray for her to continue to heal as well as Judy Kid, Kidwell to continue to heal. I know we have others on our hearts and on our minds that, are, that we're lifting up in our prayers. As you know, we want to continue every, every time we meet to lift up our search committee in prayer. Y'all continue to pray for them, support them. And I'm going to ask again, continue, don't push them. Don't ask, when do you got a preacher coming? Don't ask that. They're, they're working. Trust me, they want to get this done as much as anybody. So they're working, they're trying to be patient, and they're trying to wait on God's call. So continue to keep the search committee in your prayers as well. You've got a great search committee. So we know that they're look, look, listening for and seeking God's will in this time. So let's lift all them, the, them up and this up to God in prayer this morning. Father, we want to thank you for just who you are as we come to worship and to praise you. Father, we praise you for who you are and for what you have done. Father, we just thank you for this time as we celebrate uh, today as we celebrate Palm Sunday, Father, and, and ne next week as we celebrate the resurrection of your son, Father, just thank you that we can have the hope that you provide and know, uh, Father, about our salvation through your son. Thank you for his death, burial, resurrection, Father, and ascension. Thank you for the, the preparation, Father, for when we all get to heaven. Father, just thank you for Jesus. Father, we want to lift them up to you. We want to lift those prayer requests, lift Tamara up to you, Father. We ask that you just heal her body. Father, get her and the doctors, help the doctors, get her to a point to where she can travel and make it home to be with her little boy. Father, be with her and her daughter. Be with Dean and Anson and all them as they, as they help encourage them, Father, and lift them up. And we want to pray for Tamara and for her daughter and for salvation, Father, that you just draw them make yourself real to them through this and draw them to you to understand the hope that they can have through your son jesus christ thank you father for that thank you for dean and and his love for you and his his service father we just want to lift them up father we want to lift up james to you and you just father we ask that you heal him but work through his life encourage nancy as as she's figuring out what's what to do father and just work through this to, to, for your glory. And Father, if there's anybody connected to this that does not know you, we ask that you just draw them to you. Use this for your glory to enhance your kingdom. Father, thank you for that. We ask that you just be with Faye as she continues to heal and encourage her. Thank you for her encouragement to others, Father, through this. Thank you for her sweet spirit, her love for you. And we just ask that you continue to heal her body as well as Judy, continue to heal her body, Father, and encourage her, Judy, as well, Father, and just help her. We know that they're get down at times, Father, but just encourage them in their spirit and heal their body. Thank you, Father, for our search committee, the blessing that they are to us. Father, we ask that you just continue to, to bless them, to work through them, to to open their eyes to what your will is, Father, for your church. Father, we know that they're seeking you. We know that they love you and that they want the best and what you want for this church. So just work in their lives, work in the committee. And Father, just make known your will for who you have as pastor of Central Baptist Church. We know that none of this is a surprise, and you know all this already. You have this planned. And, Father, just make that known to them. 
thank you, Father, for the time we can come together to worship you, to lift up your name and worship and praise through music, through prayer, through giving, Father, and in a few moments through opening up of your word. Be with Brother Jeff as he has prepared your message. Just speak through him what you want us to hear. And Father, open our hearts and minds to be receptive to your word. Be with us as we sing praise to you. And Father, in that all we do this morning is for your honor and your glory. Thank you for the love, mercy, and grace you show each and every day. It's in the name of your son we pray. Amen. 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 Well, a couple of things we have going on. We've got a couple of uh, things planned in April. We've already planned our next game night for the third Saturday of April, so be ready for that. I believe it's the 20th. Be ready for that. Tonight, we will have Lord's Supper service following the message, so if you're able to be here tonight, you will be blessed. Uh, Jeff will be back, as well as several of you asked who's preaching next week. Jeff will be back next week and will bless us as well. I know that you're looking forward to that. Also, the choir has got a cantata that we're going to present at the beginning of the service next week. So you're going to want to be here for that. That's a great time, a great message, and great music. And, and you'll be able to sing with us in, in some of these songs in the cantata. And then, yes, there will be some you don't know. But that's fine. So, anyway, this morning we are glad you were here. Um, I think that's all I have. Anything else? No? No? I think that's all I have. I'm looking at everybody like they know. <laughs> I'm glad you were here. All right, let's get to this point. I'm going to invite you to spend just a moment welcoming one another, and I'm going to ask that you just welcome those that are around you. Don't run all over the sanctuary. And just spend a moment welcoming one another. So let's stand for just a moment.
pray. Thank you, Father, for your love and for your mercy. And Father, your name does stand special in our lives this morning as we come to worship you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. And Father, at this time, as we, we worship you and, and just giving back a, a portion of what you've gave us and allowed us to have, and Lord, we just ask that it be used to the building of your kingdom, Lord, in whatever way that you deem that it should. And Father, just guide and direct, and we we'll just give you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Feed us for our use, thy folds prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast bought us, thine we are. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou 
thou hast bought us thine we are. Amen. Amen. Thank you, worship team, for leading us. Thank you for that beautiful special music. Uh, you know, I was uh, reminded of a verse as we were singing. Uh, some of you may be like me. I, <clears throat> when it comes to singing, I make a really good preacher. Uh, think about that for a second. <laughs> I, uh, I love to sing, and I've learned a lot more about singing uh, since uh, I have been married for the last 51 years. There have been times that I've had to be involved in uh, the singing, the leading of, of music. My wife was a piano, uh, or played the piano. Her grandmother, every month, sent $3 to give her piano lessons. Uh, that should have been a red flag that she was going to become a preacher's wife. There have been times uh, that a church has called us because they didn't really care how I preached just as long as Donna could play the piano. Uh, that, and that's not really true. She, she's played the piano in a lot of, a lot of the churches that we've been in. She's, she's helped any time she's needed to. For 16 years when we were with the Bivens Foundation, we would do three services a day. And she would play the piano as I would lead the music. And uh, I love to sing. Uh, but to say I love to sing and then come paired to somebody like Andy and, and uh, the choir and some of the, some of the others uh, really doesn't even hold a candle. But I was reminded as we were singing of this verse in uh, Ephesians chapter uh, 5. Uh, the Bible says, uh, well, oh, I was looking at the wrong page. I tell you, I, we didn't get to bed till a little after two last night. We uh, had a little incident, and some of you have asked uh, why Donna's not here. And uh, she, we had a little problem and had to go to the ER. And if you've ever been to the ER, they just love to let you be there a long time. And uh, you know, you just want to say, "Well, break out the dominoes. We're going to be here this many hours." <laughs> But uh, uh, she got home, and they got things under control. And, and so we didn't get to bed till after 2 o'clock. So my, uh, my, uh, my vision is, is, a little, is a little shaky right here. But in Ephesians uh, chapter 5, uh, in, well, starting with verse 18, it says, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is, uh, that is a... a Des, uh, desperation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another, and this is what I want you to hear, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual singings, and then comma, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. We are, the scripture says, and then again in Colossians, it, it repeat, Paul repeats this, we are to sing to one another. Whenever we come together and, and uh, we have such special uh, talent as you have here at Central uh, and we're being led, we are singing to God because it says making melody in your heart towards the Lord. But before that it says singing to one another. We're singing to one another. We're to greet one another with that, with that song in our heart, with psalms and singing and spiritual music is what he says here. Uh, we are to greet one another in that way. Now that's, that's kind of uh, hard to think about, and you, I don't expect that whenever you come in next Sunday that the greeters are going to start singing to you. Uh, and, and especially I won't start singing to you. Uh, that's why Andy's there. Maybe he'll start singing to us. But, uh, but, but we are to have that song, that expression of praise on our face and, and in our hearts and in our soul. 
And sometimes we may not feel like it, but we are to have that expression of praise. And we are to do that. And sometimes, and I, I was raised a Baptist, will be a Baptist till I die, but sometimes us Baptists get a little bit, uh, a little bit scared to express anything, think, well, how do we may think I'm doing something in the Spirit, you know? Well, well, if we're not doing it in the Spirit, according to this, we're, we're, we're not right with the Lord. We, we need to have the Spirit of God manifested in us to one another. Now, that's a little side sermon. Let's see if I have time for the rest of the sermon. We're going we're gonna to look at Romans 8, 28 through 39 uh, this morning. And as we look at that, we're kind of wrapping up, and, and I've been all over the place in Romans chapter 8, uh, because Romans chapter 8 is, is the most important chapter for you and I as believers to understand and, and to grab hold of and let it grab hold of us. There's no, other, there's no other chapter in the Bible that really brings us to the focus of what living the salvation that God has given us through His grace is all about. Uh, we, uh, I've, I've read this a couple of times, but uh, in his book, uh, All the Way Home, Derek Thomas says that Romans chapter 8 reaches a sustained level of ground for believers as there is in our spiritual growth. We need to understand that, and we need to grab hold of that. So we're going to look at Romans chapter 8, starting verse 28. Last week we talked about, or, or week four last, praying in the Spirit, Romans 8, 26 and 27. Uh, <clears throat> since we have, uh, uh, since I have been here, uh, we started out, first Sunday I was here uh, looking at peace, the peace of God through the Spirit. The peace of God, peace with mankind, that word peace in, uh, in Hebrew is shalom, and it actually means completeness a blessing, a manifestation of divine grace. That's what walking in the Spirit is all about, having that, that peace about us. And I really think that's what Paul was saying in Ephesians 5 that I just read, greeting each other with, with, with a psalm, with a, with a song, with a, with a spiritual music. It, it's that divine peace that just radiates from us. And, uh, and, and that's, that's what the first Sunday was about. The second uh, Sunday that I was here, we talked about being led by the Spirit in Romans 8, 11. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. David said in Psalms, Let your good Spirit... Lead me on. We need to grab a hold of that, being led by the Spirit. And then we talked about, the uh, week before last, praying in the Spirit. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, salvation that we find uh, through living in the Spirit of God. As we look at Romans eight twenty eight through 39, uh, we see that God is leading us and drawing us to the image of Christ. And that puts a whole new perspective on especially Romans chapter 8 or 28. Our salvation is of God. And our salvation uh, is not because of something we have done, and we understand that. We don't always, we don't always practice that. Uh, we understand it, but we don't always practice it. It's not of anything that we have done. Look at, listen to some of the songs that we have in the hymn. I'm not going to, in the hymn, I'm not going to sing them, but just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark plot, to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. John Newton in the 1700s wrote that beautiful song that, that, that every New Testament church I know of claims is their, 
as their anthem. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved what? A wretch like me. God didn't, God didn't save a perfect person. He saved a wretch like me. I love that song. Mercy, there was great and grace was free. Pardon, there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. How many of you have been blessed by rock of ages cleft for me? Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from the from uh, let the water and the blood from thine riven side which flow be of sin the double cure. Cleanse me from its guilt and power. Not the labor that my hands have done can fill thy law's demand. And that's what Romans, Romans is all about. Not the labor of my hand can the law's demand, fill the law's demand. Could my soul no respite know? Could my tears forever flow for all sin? I cannot atone. Thou must save and thou alone. The music that we sing expresses that God's salvation is an act of grace. Nothing I bring in my hand. Naked I came to thee for dress. Helpless, look to thee for grace. Foul, I to the fountain flew. Wash me, Savior, lest I die. Even the music we sing expresses that Our salvation is not of any merit that we have done. It is God. Romans 8, 28 does not say, And God causes all things to work together for the good of those that have really done great. doesn't say that. It says, We know that God causes all things to work together for the good of them that love the Lord, that He is called according to His purpose. It also doesn't say that all things are going to be good because there are going to be times when things aren't good and yet it's still God using that to draw us towards His good. This statement is God working through all that happens in our life. Uh, I heard an example one time of an inchworm that was crawling across a beautiful woven uh, Indian carpet, carpet from India. If any of you have ever had one of those, those rugs, those carpets from India, they're beautiful and the color is rich. And the inchworm would crawl across the vibrant red and he would be inflamed and, and he would be excited and then he'd crawl across the blues and be peaceful and the greens and his soul would feel like it was growing and across the black and his soul would feel despair. There are those moments in all of our life when we feel that richness uh, and that growth and then that despair and that agony. And all those things work together when that worm became a caterpillar. And it flew up into the sky and it looked down and it saw that beautiful, beautiful Indian rug. God is going to give us that moment to where we look back and we see that all the things that have happened in our life have worked together to create a tapestry of beauty in our life. Verse 30 tells us what working all things to the good of them that love the Lord, that are called according to His purpose. We have to go on from 28 and 29 to verse 30 because God's working those things, not just so things will be good for us, but He's working those things in our life. The good that it's talking about is that in verse 30 it says, and those whom He predestined, To be conformed to the image of Christ, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. We are being called into the image of Christ so that God can 
justify us and glorify us. That's His plan for our life. That's His grace in our life. And whenever we celebrate Easter Sunday, we celebrate that Christ came in order that we could conform to His image. In their image we were created, Genesis tells us. And the problem is we've become like those treasures that have been buried or sunken that have, have been covered with rust and even those treasures that they brought up out of the water, out of the oceans that have been there for hundreds of years and bonicle, bonicles have, have surrounded them and they have to carefully cut all of that away and they have to carefully bring it back to the image that it was created to be and we were created to be in the image of Christ. And all things work together for that purpose. That's the good. All things work together for the purpose of us being conformed to the image of the Son of God. We can't say this enough. Our personal walk with God on this earth is a progressive, a progressive conformity to Christ's image. Whenever I've done premarital counseling, I always ask this question. And I've, I've had some strange looks as I've asked this question. I'll ask the wife, do you like, or, or the bride, do you like the groom's father? Well, I, you know, he's all right. I'll ask the groom, do you like the bride's mother? Because y'all are going to probably grow up to be a whole lot like your dad or your mother. If you don't like them, then you may not like each other eventually. My dad's been gone since 2016. And yet every morning I look in the mirror and I say, well, dad, what are you doing in there? I catch myself saying things and doing things and hopefully... There are things that have been a little bit more refined because you, you do that to the next generation. You, you, you learn from your parents. But we become that image. We work like they work. We, we move like they move. Whenever my dad was at the point to where he had to accept the fact that he was dying. He loved the Lord, and he was like Paul, for me to live as Christ, for me to die as gain. And yet he wanted, Paul wanted, if we've been studying in Philippians, Paul wanted to keep on. As he wrote the Philippians, and he said that, then he went on to say, and I'm planning on coming to see you, for me to live as Christ, for me to die as gain, and yet I'm coming to see you. He never did make that next trip to see them. Dad wanted to keep living, but whenever he finally realized from the doctors that it was time well we made arrangements through Bivens and and the hospice people that we worked with at Bivens uh, for the nurse to come over on a Sunday night and and she visited with him and visited with us as a family and and he signed the papers to go into the hospice program next morning I was walking down the hall at Bivens and this nurse saw me and she said oh Jeff I'm sorry about your dad and I thought he just entered hospice you're telling me you're sorry what you know did something happen I didn't know about it and I said what do you mean and she said well he called me early this morning and fired us <laughs> I thought he what <laughs> and so we spent another couple of weeks one more trip to the emergency room on Christmas Eve night the doctor came in and he showed us the x-rays and uh, of his lungs and and uh, all of one lung was, was dead, and two-thirds of the second lung is dead. And he said, buddy, all of the treatments that you could possibly go through are, is not going to change that picture. And whenever the doctor left Christmas Eve, my mom and sister and, and wife went home, take mom home back to Canyon. And my brother and I were waiting for dad to be transported back home in the ambulance. Dad was sitting up and he said, well, boys, I sure would like a bowl of creamed potatoes and white gravy. 
he'd accepted. It was 8.30 Christmas Eve night, and I thought, Dad, I'm going to get you cream potatoes and white gravy. I'm not sure where. <laughs> you know, I went down to the hospital cafeteria. They had already closed up. But I got in, and this lady saw me, and I told her what I needed. And I said, I know that y'all are already closed. You're out of stuff. She said, you know what? I can get you a bowl of cream potatoes, and we have a little white gravy. If you don't mind me microwaving the gravy. And I brought that to Dad, and he ate it. And he became so at peace. He knew that God's plan for his life to be conformed to the life of Jesus had come to the point to where now Jesus was going to present him to the Father. That next day on Christmas Day, I was sitting beside Dad in, in his living room. It's just Dad and I. And I said, Dad, you've taught me all my life how to work. And he did. There were times that he worked for the public on a side job. And I would be with him out in the country in a pickup. And he was climbing a pole. He was an electrician. And I was down on the bottom there really wasn't much for me to do. And he said, Jeff, we never know when the people that have hired us are watching. He said, look busy. Because I need you down there. When I need you, I need you to be there. So you need to be looking busy until I call you to do what I need you to do. And he said, even if you take things from one side of the pickup to the other side of the pickup, just look busy. Just be busy. And he taught us that. He taught us to work, and he taught us work ethics. And I said, Dad, you've taught us that. You've taught us how to go to church. You've taught us how to love the Lord. You've taught us to give of ourselves to God. And I said, Dad, it pains me. But now God's given you the opportunity to teach us the likeness of Christ in how to die. And I took his hand and I said, thank you, Dad, for teaching us all the way to the last breath. That's, what's being, that's what being conformed to the image of Christ is. And sometimes those things are not absolutely good every single time. But they are to the purpose of good, which is to be conformed to the image of Christ. The Holy Spirit's purpose is a lifetime work on us. A little boy... With, saw a, 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 a man that the city had, had uh, hired to, to uh, sculpt out of marble this beautiful horse that represented uh, the activities of that city. And, and the sculptor was, was busy at work. The little boy said, how do you know how to make that look like a horse? And the sculptor turned and said, it's real easy, son. You just chip away everything that doesn't look like a horse. You see, we were conformed to the image of God, to the image of Christ, to the, the Son, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. We were conformed to that. We, we, we were formed in that image, and now we're being transformed or reformed into that image. And all the barnacles of sin and all of the scars and all of the rusts are being chipped away by the Holy Spirit, that we might be conformed to that image of Christ. It's a lifetime work of chipping away everything that doesn't look like Christ. There's a song that I sing to myself quite often. It's a song that I've always sung whenever I just was in a troubling time in my life. I need thee every hour. But it's interesting, if you go back and read about the lady that wrote that song, Annie Hawks, in 1887, she was a housewife and a mother. She was going about the task one day of doing the things that she always did. She was cleaning, she was preparing to cook, she was singing, and she really was in a happy moment. And all of a sudden, she said, I became so filled with the sense of the nearness of the Master, wondering how anyone could live without Him, either in joy or in pain. She said to herself, I need you every hour. 
I, I'm going to read a couple of those verses here in just a second. All things work together for the good, whether in joy, whether in pain. They work together for the good of those that love the Lord, that are called according to God's purpose. And they're working towards the good of being conformed to the image of Christ. And you know what? We need Him every hour, even when we think we don't need Him. Even when there is a lightness in our step and a fun in our step and we're doing things that are fun. She wrote, I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to thee. I need thee every hour. In joy or in pain. Come quickly and abide, or life is a vain. And then it ends with, I need thee every hour, most holy one. Oh, make me thine indeed, my blessed son. I need thee every hour. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. There's not a moment in our life that we don't need God working All things together for the good, for the conforming to the image of Christ. The little things, the big things. Let us pray. Father, I thank you that you love us. I thank you, Lord God, that we can come together and we can sing to one another praises and and psalms and sing, psalms and songs and spiritual music. We can sing to one another the melodies of our heart, and then we express the melodies of our heart to you because you are busy at work in all things, working together for the good of being conformed to the image of your precious Son. Thank you, Lord, that you love us that much. Thank you that you don't leave us, oh, wretched man that I am, as Paul expressed in the last verses of chapter 7. But through you, we have been redeemed. Through you, we are being conformed. Thank you, Lord. I pray if there are any here this morning that do not know you as Savior, that your spirit is speaking to their heart, tugging at their heart. If there are any here that have kind of just been walking around not realizing how you're wanting to conform them to your image, God, I pray that today would be the time they'd say, Oh, Lord, as I lift my heart to you, conform me to the image of your Son. Lord, I pray that there will be a response to your word that will be radical and changing and conforming in the hearts of people today. We pray in your precious name, knowing and believing. Amen. As we stand together, as we're led in a hymn, you respond as God would have you to. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. say thank you to Carl Parks for leading the music last week. I think he did a wonderful job. So if you see him, giving, just let him know thank you for filling in for us. We're blessed to have men that will be willing and able to fill in and do a great job of leading in the music. 
Also say thank you to Jeff for being here the last couple months. He will be here next week for Easter Sunday. Uh, so, and we look forward to that as well. I want to remind you tonight we are having the Lord's Supper. So I want to encourage y'all to be back. And when you come in, I'm going to invite you to sit in the middle section. Don't be Northern nor Southern Baptist. Be Central Baptist. <laughs> that just came to me. I'm going to invite you to sit in the middle section and toward the front so that when our deacons share the Lord's Supper, they don't have to go all over the world. And they can find us all together in Central Baptist Church. Hey, it happens once a year. Anyway, no, we are grateful y'all are here. I want to invite y'all to sing here in just a, just a moment. Um, but I want to remind you also, do ministry. Don't wait for a pastor. Don't wait. Don't wait. Do ministry. If you're called to do a part of ministry in this church, which if you're a part of this church, you're called to do ministry in this church. Do ministry. We are not in a transition period. We are in a period where we are the church. You can be the church even when we don't have a lead pastor here. So, do ministry. Seek the Word, seek God's Word, and do ministry. I'm going to invite you all to join hands together, and let's sing as we dismiss, and we'll see you tonight. Sing together, God is good. God is good all the time. He put a song of praise in this heart of mine. God is good all the time. Through the darkest night, His light will shine. God is good. God is good all the time. Amen. We'll